Stratified sampling is another common form of probabilistic sampling. In stratified sampling, we simply divide the entire population into distinct exclusive groups, or strata, first. Then, we perform simple random sampling within each one of those strata. This technique is extremely common for sampling in marketing research and also political polling for a few major reasons. Let's first illustrate how stratified sampling works, and then we'll elaborate on why we use stratified sampling in marketing research. Let's imagine that we are hired by a company where their objective for us is to measure the average intentions to renew the teletherapy service for their current customer base. We're still studying those without a college degree, like the previous example, but there's something new here. The company wants us to estimate these renewal intentions, not just for the whole customer base without a college degree, but also for each one of their specific therapy motivator customer segments that they have inside their CRM system. Specifically, each one of their active customers is segmented into one of these six profiles. Those who are primarily focused on anger management, those pursuing serenity, those pursuing joy, those managing grief, those mostly fixated on their love life, and those who are trying to manage compulsive tendencies. So now, since we know these unique characteristics about each one of the customers based on the CRM system, and our objective is to analyze the intentions to renew for each one of these segments, we first identify these individuals. So since we're using stratified sampling, we now organize the individuals. Normally this would be done with a simple Excel sheet or whatever software tool allows us to organize the groups. Within each one of these six strata or customer segments, we will then perform simple random sampling within each of the groups. And that completes stratified sampling. But why do we do stratified sampling? The first reason is stratified sampling is essential when one or more of the subgroups that you're interested in studying are relatively infrequent in the total population of interest. Consider the following example. Bud Light is a sponsor of San Diego Pride Festival, among many other Pride Festivals across the globe. Let's imagine a Bud Light brand manager would like to know more about the beliefs that Bud Light drinkers have toward the brand. First, the brand manager would like to study beliefs among all drinkers of Bud Light. Further, and this will be important for our study here, the brand manager would also like to specifically analyze beliefs among the male, gay, bisexual, and transsexual population. If we just use simple random sampling, this research objective could create a challenge for us. And here's why. According to secondary research, Roughly 60% of all Bud Light drinking individuals identify as male. Further, in the United States, the current state of research suggests that amongst males, 3.7% identify as members of the GBT community. Now, if we did simple random sampling, it'd be almost certainly true that the resulting sample would have far too few GBT males in it for us to conduct any meaningful analysis on this subgroup that we do want to conduct analysis on. Let's imagine what we, when we did simple random sampling, we sampled and collected data on a thousand total Bud Light drinking respondents. Well, since 60% of those were likely to be male, we would have six, 600 male Bud Light drinkers. And of those 600 males, we'd I expect that about 3.7% would identify as GBT. If that's the case, that would mean from a sample of 1,000, we would only have 22 individuals who identify as male GBT. That's a very small sample in terms of analysis. Let me show you the consequences of having too small of a sample size when you try to conduct a group analysis. Let's imagine that we asked a survey question, Bud Light is a beer brand that truly cares about all people on a five-point Likert scale. And we simply measured the individuals who either agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. 30% of all men who identified as straight agreed with this, and 50% of the individuals who identified as GBT agreed with this. At first, it seems like there's a substantial difference, but let's focus in on the fact that we only have 22 individuals in this subgroup. When we actually calculate our margin of error in our estimates using a, with a 95% confidence interval level, using the standard equation, which we talk about in other videos, we see that for men who identify as straight, our margin of error in the estimate is only four percentage points. However, in this much smaller sample size for GBT men, our margin of error in our estimate is 21 percentage points. Let's look at that visually. Wow. With the margin of error depicted, we can clearly see the problem of our small sample size. 
With this lack of precision, there's really no useful information here for a marketing manager. Further, because of the lack of precision in the small subgroup, we really can't draw any meaningful conclusions about whether or not these two groups are actually different once we account for statistical uncertainty. This is where stratified sampling could have overcome this problem. Since we knew going into this study that we should have expected that male GBT members were less prevalent within the total population, we should have purposefully planned to oversample male GBT individuals. Let's illustrate the consequence of purposefully oversampling this group by a factor of 10. Now again, notice here on the far right hand side, the only thing that's different is this is the oversampling scenario by a factor of 10. So now our sample size is 220. Interestingly, we would still expect that the average percent who agree would be the same for these two groups. Sample size itself doesn't affect the average, the average uh, that we would most likely expect. It just affects our precision and our uncertainty. So now when we calculate our margin of error estimates, we still have four points of error here. Still have 21 points of error on both sides in the sample of 22. But we only have a margin of error of seven points now that we've increased an oversample to 220. Thanks to oversampling, our confidence interval is now much narrower, meaning we've gained much more precision in our estimates. And clearly, now we can make more meaningful inferences and comparisons between these two groups that are interested. I should note that when people are introduced to the idea of stratified sampling, specifically the act of oversampling relatively low percentage groups, a common critique is that oversampling a smaller minority population will bias research results when analyzing the whole population. Simply put, this critique is entirely baseless and wrong. That's because we purposefully oversampled a particular minority population. If we intend to then merge the results back and do entire aggregate analysis, we would readjust the weight of that oversampled group, weighing them back down again, so that our proportions are adjusted appropriately when we conduct analysis in the whole population. Another reason that we sometimes use stratified sampling is because it might be possible to reduce the time, effort, and money we spend on sampling if two conditions are true. First, our research focus is on specifically analyzing within and between the strata, so we're purposely intending on comparing between subgroups and less on the overall whole. Secondly, we have a strong, credible belief that the variable we're studying is more homogeneous within each strata than it is in the general population and aggregate. We'll illustrate what that means later. In this example, let's imagine that the thing we're trying to study is the percent of people who can name a fictional character. Can you name this character? By the way, this is the Riddler. Now let's imagine that the total population that we're interested in studying for this can you identify and name the Riddler question is all San Diego Comic-Con attendees. But there's also two subgroups that we're more particularly interested in. First, subgroup one are those San Diego Comic-Con attendees who do not read comic books. Interestingly, the success of comic book culture in mainstream media and major movies has been so that comic book characters are often never actually read as comics by those who enjoy them. The other subgroup we're interested in are San Diego Comic-Con attendees who do read comic books. Our initial hypothesis is that amongst San Diego Comic-Con attendees, 40% will be able to name the Riddler when presented an image. For those who do not read comic books, our hypothesis is that only 13% will be able to. And for those who do read comic books, 90% will be able to name this individual. What's important to notice at this point is notice how the answer, our hypothesis to identification of the Riddler is much more homogeneous within the two subgroups. The majority of people we hypothesize cannot name that individual if they do not read comic books, which is a much more homogeneous answer, or those who do read comic books can identify, which again is a more homogeneous answer compared to the overall San Diego Comic-Con, which is a 40-60 split. That's much more heterogeneous. Now, across all three groups, if we only want an error margin of three percentage points at a 95% confidence interval, and we apply the optimal sample size formula, we'll find that we need to collect 1,025 individuals if we study the entire population. 
However, if we first split into two subgroups, we'll need a sample size of 483 and 385. Something seemingly magical happens here. Somehow, by splitting the total population into two distinct groups and then calculating the sample size, we reduced our overall sample size by 157. If you add up 483 and 385, you notice that's much less than 1,225. That could save us thousands of dollars, days, and hours of hard work for sample collection, which really sounds nice. But how in the world are we able to actually reduce our overall sample size merely by splitting into two groups before we do the calculations? Notice that our margin of error never changed and our level of confidence in our estimates never changed. There's only one thing that actually changed. It's the nature of our hypothesis. Again, in the subgroups, our hypotheses are suggesting a much more homogeneous answer to the Riddler question, while in the overall population, a much more heterogeneous answer, 40%, closer to a 50-50 split. When we calculate optimal sample size, the less variance of a variable that we're trying to measure leads us to require a smaller sample size to produce a precise answer. The intuition here, before any math, is if everyone in a subgroup thinks the same or very similar thing, you won't need as many people to be confident in your generalization about that thing. For example, I already know that an enormous percentage of individuals like pizza. Therefore, I probably won't have to collect a very large sample to get a precise estimate of the percentage of individuals who like pizza. There's so much consistency in that answer, I won't need a large sample size. On the other hand, attitude towards very spicy foods, at least in the United States, is much more heterogeneous. Some people are big fans of very spicy foods and other individuals are not very big fans of spicy foods. Therefore, we'll probably need to collect much more data to get a precise percentage estimate to that question. So just what is the idea of sample weights? Sample weights are used to adjust the representativeness of a sample so that it better aligns with a population of interest. Sample weighting is essentially always used when stratified sampling is performed. Uh, the phrase post-stratification weights is often commonly used to describe this. In addition, sample weighting is almost always used when the sample, even if it's from a simple random sample, is meant to be reflective of adults in the United States or some other country that has a well-established demographic information. For example, in the syndicated marketing data set uh, Simmons Local, best illustrated through the Simply Analytics tool we have available at SDSU, they indeed use sample weights because they're interested in as, uh, projecting their results to the United States. Uh, you've probably also seen a footnote in a political poll at some point in your life that read something along the lines of a sample of X US voting adults was weighted to adjust for gender, age, ethnicity, political party, and so on and so on and so on. Another common example where sample weights are prevalent. To actually do sample weighting, there's a couple prerequisites that we have to have. First, you actually have to know the characteristics and distribution of those characteristics of your population ahead of time before you do the study. For example, if the population of your study was SDSU students, if you check out the SDSU Analytic Studies and Inst Institutional Research website, for example, they provide a summary demographic profile of SDSU students at both the undergraduate and graduate level. Of course, the US Census would be a very common example of where we already know the demographic composition of the US population by virtue of a well-validated uh, secondary tool. The second condition is we have to observe that in our sample, the relative or important characteristics of the population doesn't match between the population and the sample. If they do match up close or very closely, we don't necessarily need to do sample weighting at all. When these two things are true, it is possible to correct for any problems, meaning discrepancies between sample and population characteristic by use of sample weights. So let's show an illustration of sample weights in action and why it matters for marketing research. Let's imagine the following scenario. We used a random landline phone calls to survey our customers. This resulted in too many older respondents and too few younger respondents. Further, your sample included far too many women compared to the overall population of your customer base. Thanks to a previous research project that your company conducted, 
you already know the population characteristics of your customers. And here's a highly simplified table to illustrate how this would work. Notice here in the middlemost column where it says population, which had to be known ahead of time before we did our study, we can see that amongst all of the customers, 30% are men under 40, 20% are men 40 and over, 40% are women under 40, and 10% are women 40 and over. In our sample, on the other hand, only 10% of the respondents were men under 40, and 40% of the respondents were women 40 and over. Clearly, there's a mis mismatch between our population and sample. The solution to this is that we need to calculate an appropriate sample weight for each one of these four different demographic profiles. The basic calculation for sample weight is very easy. You simply take the percentage that's known in the population and divide it by the percentage that's known in the sample and you derive your weight. For example, taking 30% for men under 40 and dividing it by 10% for men under 40 arrives at a sample weight of 3.0. The intuition here is when we analyze men under 40 in our sample, we count them for three times as much because they're underrepresented in our sample and we need to weigh them higher to better account for their representation in the population. So now let's imagine that we have our, we're looking at our spreadsheet of data that we've collected from this study. So we have someone's gender, we have their age, and we have their customer satisfaction score on a one to 10 point scale. In addition, we've applied sample weights to each one of these individuals. Now notice at the bottom here, the average score we have right now is 7.4. This 7.4 is what we call the unweighted satisfaction. In other words, we're ignoring for a moment here these weight calculations. Once we apply these calculations, uh, these weight calculations, the opinions of our in our sample of men under 40 will count for more because they're currently underrepresented in the pool. On the other hand, women over 40 in our sample, we will underweight their answers because they're overrepresented in our sample and we want it to better adjust for our population. Now we've applied our weights to the satisfaction score here we can see the mathematical computations of the first two, straightforward. And then once we apply the weights, we simply take the average. And we notice a big shift in our weighted average satisfaction score. Now our satisfaction score is only 4.5. That's terrible for a company. What's going on here? If you inspect each one of these rows, an interpretation you would arrive to is that men and women under 40 were not very satisfied with our company but they were underrepresented in our original sample. So once we added weight scores to those individuals, their dissatisfaction is better represented in our overall weighted satisfaction score. A few final thoughts that we need to keep in mind for sample weights in marketing research. In reality, the simple example I just provided here uh, really illustrates how sample weights work, but the act of doing sample weighting in practice and in the real world can be a bit more complex and requires a lot of complex statistical and mathematical considerations. And something that people often overlook, um, when someone says that they engage in sample weighting, that's really an incomplete explanation. Um, sample weights can only fix the things that you actually adjust for. In other words, if someone does adjust sample weights by age and income and nothing else, that doesn't fix the, any uh, under or over representation with gender, religion, education, or something else. So when someone says they've performed sample weighting, the follow-up that you should often ask or look for in the reading is, what did they adjust for in their sample weights? Also, sample weighting is not a magic bullet. Even the fanciest sample weighting schemes can't completely fix problems associated with, say, opt-in online polls or other forms of non-probabilistic sampling. Gotta hit this point hard. Sample weights work great or can work great when probabilistic and proper sampling procedures are used. They cannot fix non-probabilistic sampling problems or poor sampling practices.